Dear friends, so maybe I will start the session. I have a message from our technician that the recording is open. So let me welcome all four guests of tonight's session of the second uh, presentation of the conference formating the reformed, which is uh, dealing and focusing on the methodology of our teaching. And uh, tonight we have a guest from uh, all the world, let's say from Jakarta, Indonesia, from St. Petersburg, uh, from uh, Russia and from Prague. We have two guests, uh, Pavel Bichler and Alexandra White. So there is uh, Dmitry Melensky in St. Petersburg and MG Rogonto in uh, Indonesia. Ringot, sorry. Uh, tonight's uh, four videos, a presentation which our guests prepared uh, as a kind of uh, video essays about uh, how the institution, uh, which is uh, focusing on uh, educating art, should look like. Why should we uh, have art students? Uh, what what they should they should achieve while studying art, and uh, what cannot be achieved and uh, what is the role of art in today's society. So these four uh, videos and later there will be discussions about them, uh, about the topics uh, uh, are dealing with the role of uh, art school with uh, from several points of view. So first we will screen uh, the sample of the initiative from Jakarta, Good School, and I will just read briefly the introduction, then we will screen the video and uh, I will introduce further and further. And lately we will have a guest uh, commenting their own visions and ideas. So uh, Good School was uh, formed in 2018 uh, through the group, Ruan Grupa, together with Serum and Graphis Hura Hura, who, initiated uh, kind of platform for contemporary art and ecosystem studies um, in public learning space. Wood School is designed as a collective working simulation study space that promotes the importance of critical and experimental dialogue through a sharing process and experience-based learning. Wood School developed a paid program as a form of support for a knowledge distribution model. This model is one of the strategies implemented to create an independent sustainability system. Um, the system is paid, allows each participant involved in good school to support one another and is available in several financing options with the donations and self-help system. So, Lately, I will ask uh, MG Ringotto about some details, but now I, I will ask our technician, Victor, to, to screen the video. Ya, 
bebas dong nih kartu gua apakah kolektifmu sudah membentuk karirmu gitu uh, buat gue uh, ya pasti tentu aja kolektif udah membuat membentuk karir gue ya sampai sekarang gitu misalnya uh, kayak kerja kuratorial profesi yang gue gelutin sekarang itu uh, kurang lebih ya uh, dari kolektif uh, kesempatannya dari kolektif gitu dan gue juga menerapkannya di kolektif gue gitu jadi waktu itu pas pertama kali gue belajar tentang uh, kelas kuratorial itu kesempatannya dari Sigit gitu pas uh, dia posting di Facebook terus ngasih kesempatan siapa yang mau uh, ikutan workshop penulisan dan kritik seni rupa, kritik seni di ruang rupa gitu terus gue komen eh langsung ikutan saat itu langsung dibayarin uh, tuh sama Sigit nah ya udah uh, belajar di situ terus ternyata keberlanjutannya adalah gue uh, gabung ke serum terus mengaktifasi galeri nah gue mempraktekkan kerja kuratorial gue di galeri serum nah terus akhirnya disitulah mulai uh, meniti karir gue gitu uh, untuk menjadi profesi kurator sampai sekarang gitu sih bagus sekali ya. <laughs> Siapa yang berikutnya? Bukan. Gua deh yang cocok. Yeah. Yang mau ambil siapa nih? MG. Hasrul. Gua milih lu, Hasrul. Hasrul, Hasrul. 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 Pengetahuan oh. apa yang kamu dapat dari kolektifmu? Uh, oh, oke, okay. pengetahuan banget. Saya, saya ya. Apa? <laughs> pengetahuan apa yang uh, didapat dari kolektifmu? Gue pikir banyak banget. Tapi uh, salah satunya sebenarnya uh, uh, bagian dari 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 apa yang gue pelajarin sebenarnya. memanage dan memaintain pengetahuan tersebut sebenarnya yang gue pikir jadi kayak ya di dalamnya kalau <coughs> kalau memanage dan memaintain gue pikir salah satunya juga ada ngomongin loyalitas anjir hmm. terus toleransi sama ya loyalitas sama toleransi sih gue pikir kalau di dalam di dalamnya <coughs> tadi ada memanage terus uh, ya banyak banget sih kayak pengetahuan soft uh, skill 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 uh, uh, kayak yang gua glutin sekarang dia juga salah satu yang yang skill mengulik skill mengulik itu sebelumnya nggak ngulik ya sebelumnya ngulik ngulik oh. tamia tapi kesempatannya sebenarnya terbuka lebar di waktu gua di kolektif gua di serum hmm. jadi jadi kayak 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 gitulah antara antara um, yang paling utama ya itu <laughs> tadi ke ada 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 apa memanage dan memaintain sih gue pikir salah satu uh, di antara dua itu yang paling utama ya di dalamnya misalkan bisa lagi diturunin kayak uh, ngomongin skill gitu kayak aktualisasi diri kalau kalau di serum sendiri kan sebenarnya self improvement paling penting ya jadi ya udah lo abis itu mau ngapain lagi gitu udah bisa ini terus lo mau ngapain lagi terus kayak memanage juga uh, ya di situ akhirnya ada benturan-benturan dengan orang-orang akhirnya harus uh, toleransi harus loyal harus uh, yaitu harus apa harus Uh, yang sifatnya kekeluargaan diselesaikan seperti itu yus nih lo ganti yang kocok uh, gue yang mau kocok iya gue yang ngambil ya op oh. gue bilang sebelah op dong oke oh, okay. oh, okay. <laughs> mau nyalain lampu ban gelap coba yang kocokan yang itu dong oke okay. uh, kuruyu kayak ayam gue gini Si lama gini. Kalau biar mix, mm-hmm. biar use. Mm. Kalau tanya rusak awas ya. Gue nggak bisa. <laughs> Yang ada logo gue sekalian mana? Semua ada. ada. Semuanya ada. Set. Mm. Apa itu bawaan? Apa yang telah kamu bagi ke kolektifmu? Wah, wow. wow. wow, bang. Hidup dan mati lo ya. Tang Erok sama Semangka ya. Nah ini yang selalu ada. Apa yang telah gue bagi ke kolektif ya. Berkolektif menurut gue tuh <coughs> apa ya. 
awalnya kan adalah sebuah keputusan jadi ya gue sadar betul sama apa yang harus sama peran-peran apa yang harus dibagi di dalamnya hmm. kalau ngomongin apa yang udah gue kasih yang pasti ya waktu tenaga ide pikiran gagasan segala macam untuk terus membuat sesuatu di kolektif agar kolektif tetap uh, tetap hidup dan kita bisa hidup dari si kolektifnya itu gitu hmm. itu sih itu doang itu doang hmm. ya gitu udah banyak kok kan oh. waktu pikiran tenaga oh, iya. semua muanya tuh. semua muanya hmm. gimana lanjut lanjut, ya, lanjut ya, dong ya. lanjut dong lo yang belum jawab belum ngocok nih belum ngocok ya? belum ngocok dari kapan? makanya udah tiga hari nih hmm. baru, baru, pulang. baru balik ya belum hmm. ngocok ya tiri 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 apa metode dasar dari kerja kolektifmu? Anjay. Metode. Tepat sekali ya pertanyaannya. Hmm. Ini kalau gua nggak bayanginnya sih karena kalau ngelihat awal mulanya tuh ya nongkrong sebenarnya hmm. jadi metode pertemanan, kebebasan bicara gitu e, tanpa ada beban. kadang kala juga nggak berharap sesuatu kan kalau nongkrong gitu ya. Hmm. Nah itu nongkrong sih karena tuh kalau gua gua pelajari gitu nongkrong jadi di nongkrong itu ada pengetahuan tacit yang terdistribusi gitu nggak hmm. sadar oh udah jadi dapat pengetahuan dapat uh, ilmu baru dari nongkrong makanya kemudian sekarang kita setelah sekian tahun gitu jadi menyadari bahwa sekolah ada awal, uh, adalah kolektif adalah sekolahan gitu hmm. buat buat anggota anggotanya soalnya kan gitu tuh coba dibandingin nih misalnya kayak sekolahan hmm. di sekolah tuh ada ada guru kan hmm. Tapi kalau di kolektif tuh ada teman belajar, hmm. kan lu belajar dari gue, gue belajar dari lu, dan hmm. su, gitu lah kan putarannya tuh. Nah terus uh, ada lagi kalau di sekolah tuh ada ada rapor, hmm. di kolektif ada evaluasi, biasanya kita ada meeting, ada evaluasi. Hmm. Di sekolah, iya ada majelis, di sekolah tuh ada uh, ada ranking, hmm. kalau di kolektif dikasih kesempatan tuh, oh yaudah nih, hmm. dikasih kesempatan atau penghargaan lah, apresiasi. Kalau di sekolah ada kelulusan, hmm. di kolektif tuh ada tujuan. Hmm. Nah, tujuannya mau bikin ini, mau kenapa kita bikin kan gitu kan, bikin proyek. Nah, di sekolah ada apa namanya? Di sekolah ada ekskul ada apa? <laughs> ada. Ya ada. Kalau ada kegiatan, kegiatan banyak banget. Ekskul semua jangan-jangan? Iya. Atau mungkin itu juga utama. Terus yang lainnya di sekolah tuh ada kurikulum. Hmm. Nah ini yang yang yang, yang utama sebenarnya. Di sekolah tuh ada kurikulum, kalau di kolektif ada lokal culture yang terbentuk di setiap kolektif. Hmm. Karena pasti beda tuh, bahkan jobnya dari serum beda sama jobnya ruang rupa hmm. misalnya, jobnya DHH juga beda lagi tuh, detail-detailnya hmm. gitu. Gak bercanda ya? Serius, gak bener banget ya. <laughs> Gue sih gitu hmm. ngebayangin ya, jadi emang kalau formulanya tuh kurang lebih begitu. Nongkrong. Hmm. nongkrong, hmm. gitu. Yeah. Oke. Okay. Okay. Kita mau main kartu kolektif hmm. nih, to. Hmm. Bikin sendiri. Oh gitu. Mau oh, jual nggak? Ngarang sendiri. Mungkin okay, nanti. Nanti ya. Ini Tapi priceless to, nggak dijual. Hmm. Bayarnya nggak pakai duit. Nggak pakai duit. Silakan diambil satu. Satu. Oh. Ini ya susah nih kayaknya nih. Apa nilai apa nilai-nilai dari kolektifmu yang ingin kamu bagikan? Oh. Apa nih to? Apa nih to? Hmm, pertama gotong royong. Gotong royong tuh contohnya misalnya gue bisa ngutang nih ke teman yang jualan di good school. Jadi gue bisa ngutang lah. Kalau ya? duit contohnya Jadi, kopi hmm. kopi gue itu gue ngutang. Terus uh, apa lagi ya? tongkrongan ya kan mm-hmm. tongkrongannya tongkrongannya karena uh, ya kalau misalnya lu nggak ada kerjaan di rumah nih mm-hmm. terus lu pengen terlihat punya kerjaan lu bilang aja ke orang rumah gua mau ke good school <laughs> bekerja <laughs> tapi ternyata lu cuma nongkrong kok <laughs> nah itu tuh tapi dari nongkrongan muncul ini nih misalnya kayak 
rencana apa gitu kan terus obrolan obrolan atau apa atau semacam eh bor lu ada kerjaan nggak gitu gitu hmm. lagi ngerjain apa ah, sih gitu terus itu terus um, apa ya uh, energi positif hmm. energi positif apakah energi positif itu gue juga nggak tahu sih sebenarnya <laughs> cuma bisa dirasakan cuma bisa dirasakan memang 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 beda beda orang yang beda beda energi positif di sini mungkin beda dengan energi positif di sana ya kan hmm. okay. macam macam okay. gitu ya sih benar cengengesan di sini positif. positif di sini oh. di negara lain enggak oh. 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 mungkin harus serius lu misalnya gitu terus kadang kadang ini juga apa uh, sesuatu yang tapi kadang kadang sesuatu yang kita anggap positif sebenarnya nggak bagus bagus amat juga bang misalnya wa, apa jam karet ya kan jam oh. kare itu kita tuh biasa-biasa aja cuma cuma karena teman-teman di good school kan sangat ini ya sangat apa apa uh, ngerti lu gitu loh jadi misalnya lu bilang oh, ntar nih gue uh, ini nih dikit lagi baru nyampe nih karena lu masih kerja apa nah itu dipahami hmm. gitulah oh, okay. gitu kira-kira sebenarnya nilainya lebih ke apa? memahami sesama hmm, 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 toleransi ini toleransi ya. kan oh, okay, okay. okay, okay. masih banyak sih cuma gue rasa sih kayak itu dulu deh Oke, okay. okay. makasih Tok. Ya, ada yang mau lanjut ngocok? Gua. Oke, okay, okay. lu. Terus siapa yang? Gua, gua, gua. Lu yang ambil. Gesha yes, yes, yang ambil. Okay. Minum dulu lah. Enggak, enggak gua mau. Biar enggak kotor nih kan. Oke, okay. coba ya. Gua ngambil yang atas aja deh. Set. Oke. Okay. Eh jatuh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, di. Lu lu enggak punya teknik kayak gua ya? Oke, hmm wah seru nih. Lagu apa yang paling menggambarkan kolektifmu? Wah, apa ya? Dia saja. Ya? Okay. <laughs> bentar, bentar, bentar dulu. Referensi <laughs> musik kita sama enggak? Iya. Ya kan? <laughs> Kalau gua malu mungkin sama seumuran Farid. Hmm. <laughs> Masih di klasik deh. Uh, hmm. Earth Wind and Fire. Hmm. Yang oh. ada lagunya Make It With You. Oh. Coba nyanyi guys. Oh. Aduh, gak bisa gua nyanyi ntar. <laughs> Lo ini karena kenapa tapi kenapa begitu tentang kayak apa make it with you membuat bersama mm-hmm. lo sudah dari kayak gini you don't know me well lo nggak bisa tahu gue kecuali lo lihat apa yang gue lakukan wah sih oh, kayak gitu kan orang tuh kita ngajelasin buat kok kadang bingung cuman mm-hmm. lo datang aja deh mm-hmm. kan gitu baiklah nih. nih gue buat komparit ya kudu mm-hmm. gue bukan anak gaplek nih set set lo lo ya. kurang mesti latihan lo anak tarot anak tarot nih mm-hmm. silakan pak dipilih mm-hmm. sesuai intuisi ya yeah. Oh gini gini gini. Lebih bagus secara grafis. Oke. Apa yang kamu anggap sebagai karya kolektif? Hmm. Oke, okay. apa tuh Om? Ini kayaknya gue juga uh, sama Merko kan yang ini hmm. uh, bisa menjawab kayaknya. Uh, oh, ini kar- aja nih. Oh ini ini gue doang. Hmm. Uh, karya yang bareng sih kalau dari Ruru sih kan gampang ya karena ada dua pas satu jadi dapur yaitu adalah menjadikan infrastruktur ya untuk uh, ekosistem kesenian cuman mesti juga punya argumentasi artistik atau estetik mm-hmm. dan itu mesti yang bukan bukan gabungan dari satu 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 mm. cuman bareng mm. jadinya apa gitu Baiklah. Sekarang siapa nih? Gue? Eh? Oh, yeah, yeah. oh lu, lu belum? Belum oh. Bukannya kartu, lu harus pengen lu, 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 lu. Apa? Ya kan pengen lagi lu. ya, pengen lagi ya Bukan, bukan gue pengen lagi gue Maksudnya biasanya kalau orang yang pemiliknya itu harusnya nyobain dulu ge. Saya... Oh gitu, ini gak ada pemilik kepemilikan toh Sip Oke, okay, yeah. gue dapet kartu ini nih Gambarnya bagus <laughs> Pengetahuan apa yang kolektif mau bagikan pada publik? Masih, ini bisa lah kita jawab bareng-bareng ya kan ya. Eh, secara tidak cermat ini ya. Iya, <laughs> cermat. Hmm. Sebagai kolektif Good School, mm-hmm. kalau gue sih yang ngeliatnya kita punya program studi kolektif. Mm-hmm. Studi kolektif itu ngundang kolektif-kolektif yang ada di seluruh Indonesia buat ngirim perwakilannya bisa belajar tentang gimana apa praktek artistik sebuah hmm. kolektif bisa dibangun hmm. wacananya sama Berto hmm. bisa ngomongin tentang semangat gotong royongnya ya hmm. toh ya hmm. sama Geisha bisa ngomongin kenapa kita harus berpameran hmm. gimana kita mengartikulasikan 
praktek artistik kita ya kan okay. tapi gitu. kalau misalnya lu bilang eh gue boleh nyela lu nggak boleh boleh, boleh. boleh. Hmm. Tapi cepat, cepat. Enggak, peraturan Tapi permainannya menit. maksudnya. Ya, ya enggak apa-apa, enggak apa. Kan yang penting ngobrol. Oh, iya. Mm-hmm. Kalau kalau gue bukan cuma kita bagikan ke publik sih, tapi kita belajar dari publik juga tuh. Mm. Misalnya kalau misalnya lu bilang wacana budaya gitu, mm-hmm. itu kan anak apa teman-teman yang ikut di program kita sekarang kan juga berbagi tentang di kampung mereka kayak gimana tuh. Ya, ya, Kurang ya. gotong royong. Nah, kita belajar dari situ juga sebenarnya. Iya, iya. Terus Jadi, apa lagi, Sal? Ya Kalau selain itu mungkin kita kayak ya benar tadi hmm. kita juga ngajakin si teman-teman kolektif hmm. kita buat nyumbangin nih lu bisa membagi pengetahuan lu di sini dengan apa bentuknya hmm. gitu ya misalnya mereka bisa ngasih short course bisa ngasih hmm. super short course juga gitu bisa diskusi hmm. dalam bentuk apa namanya misi kelasnya bersama hmm. teman-teman dari kolektif yang hmm. ikutan program studi kayak gitu hmm. atau sekedar nongkrong juga iya atau hmm. sekedar nongkrong pun itu juga apa terjadi proses ya nggak toh transfer bener, pengetahuan bener. ya hmm. gue sambil beres ini nih. jadi <laughs> memang <laughs> pengetahuannya tuh bisa direncanakan dan hmm. tidak direncanakan hmm. itu kita bagikan pertama ke teman-teman kita hmm. tapi lama-lama ya itu akan Uh, meluas lah lanjut oke okay. tok tok hmm. siapa yang mau ngambil ini gua lo aja udah lo mau ngocok lo ngocok gua ngambil terlalu bersemua gitu kalau tarot udah keluar ya <laughs> eh, benar tuh itu yang kartunya uh-huh. message nya tuh terlalu terlalu gede nih terlalu waktu oh ini kartu tarot itu nya oh. Ini aja nggak segede bar. Ini udah kayak ke board game. Sip, oke. Okay. Sip, udah gue ambilin aja. Ha, oke. Okay. Pertanyaannya, bagaimana proses transfer pengetahuan terjadi di kolektifmu? Um, kayaknya sih terjadinya mungkin ada yang kayak internal kolektif kita, ada yang eksternal kayak kita apa share ke misalnya tanda kutip publik atau siapapun yeah. yang mau belajar kan. Kalau di internal tuh transfer pengetahuan sih menurut gue satu pasti lewat nongkrong. lewat eh, nongkrong nongkrong kayak gini nih gue bikin acara baru ah, nongkrong terus kemudian juga ngerjain project gitu project. karena kayak misalkan kita ketika ngerjain suatu project kadang kita ngerjain sesuatu yang mungkin bukan skill kita atau kita belum pernah nyobain hal itu cuman akhirnya kayak tercondition terpaksa oke ini gimana caranya gitu kepepet udah deadline segala macam kita harus cari akal dan disitulah kayak proses belajarnya tapi kalau kayak tentu secara eksternal ya tentu lewat workshop workshop short course kelas kelas di mana tuh kan kayak ngeharvest kegikan kenertan masing-masing ini giginya bidang apa nerd bidang apa biarkan dia ngobrol dan sharing pengetahuan dia tapi gue rasa sebenarnya esensinya tuh ya di tentang nongkrong itu meskipun hmm. dia kelas workshop ataupun apa namanya uh, short course gitu pasti kan ada kayak proses yang cair dan kasual nggak kayak di sekolah dan yang gue senang juga ya. misalkan dengan short course ya kita ketemu orang-orang yang punya ke apa kesenangan yang hmm. sama, sama yang backgroundnya beda-beda backgroundnya beda-beda dan mungkin tuh di tempat-tempat lain nggak ada yang bikin kelas kayak mm-hmm. gitu gitu benar-benar contohnya contohnya kayak kelas bermain arsip gitu apa arsip bisa dari seni menulis oh. lirik lagu, menulis cerita seni berbasis apa, riset yang, terus kayak apa project tentang seni ruang publik kan belajar di mana gitu mm-hmm. kan sama juga menurut gue yang mencakup tuh semua tuh di sini sebagai transfer pengetahuan juga terjadi karena satu orang tuh dikasih apa ya izin buat gagal dan kepercayaan buat lo nyoba lagi gitu. Kalau lo misalkan di project ini lo nggak misalkan wah nih gue nggak bisa nih, cuman akhirnya nggak apa coba lagi coba lagi dan itu mungkin kolektif sebagai sekolah dia itu kan wow. kayak lo dapat kesempatan dong lo coba lagi gitu. Kalau kayak sekolah tadi misalnya kata MJ ada ranking terus lo nggak ada naik kelas nih bukan masalah naik kelas nggak naik kelas cuman kayak oke okay, di project ini lo coba lagi deh ngerjain ini gitu tuh sih kayaknya. Thanks. So next uh, video uh, is uh, prepared by Alexandra White. So while the first video was somehow def- defining the institution from a uh, down, from a uh, uh, initiators, then uh, Alexandra will speak about how to somehow create the nourishing and challenging 
environment within the existing artistic schools with a quite long tradition. So her, her video presentation is a kind of structure uh, portrait of, of her uh, and her uh, partner's uh, uh, studio and the profile of the studio. Uh, Alexandra uh, is a Slovenian and uh, uh, in Czech and a Slovenia living artist, studied in Prague uh, film and television school and the Academy of the Performing Arts in Prague and uh, at the State University at New York of New York at New Platz. Uh, in uh, 2008, she was awarded uh, the degree of associate professor at the Academy of Fine Arts in uh, and this de design in Ljubljana in Slovenia. Uh, she will describe the, her professional career in the in the in the next presentation. So I'm giving the space for video. One. My name is Alexandra Weid and I come from Slovenia. In order to understand my position within the institution that I represent here today on the occasion of the symposium Reforming the Reformed, I will talk just in short about my what, when and whereabouts. I believe many of my personal specifics, being a woman and a foreigner, having one of the leading positions at the most prominent national educational art institution, just for the notice that today in November 2020, on the 24th leading positions are only six women who run the studios in Prague. Presumably also conditioned my invitation to this symposium beside my professional artistic trajectory that I apply into my teaching and I consider myself to be within this context an example. After completing my studies to become a veterinary doctor, I came to Czech Republic in the year 1996 to study photography at the Film and TV School of Academy of Performing Arts in Prague. After five years of study at FAMU, I went to the United States on the Fulbright Scholarship to study for two years at the Visual Research Lab at the State University of New York at New Paltz. In the year 2007, I returned back to Prague and in 2008 started to head the studio of photography at the Academy of Arts, Architecture and Design in Prague, together with my then life and artistic partner, Czech artist, Hine Gard. I will just quickly try to outline the political and national origin of the institution, but then rather put an emphasis on the studio of photography where I teach already for the past 12 years. The Academy of Arts, Architecture and Design, also known as Academy of Applied Arts in Prague, was established in 1885 on the role of immediate models played by fine arts academies in Paris and Vienna at that time. It represented the first and only state school in Czech lands. The model of education followed the idea of master-apprentice interface and is in some way kept until today. Master of Today is a prominent and famous author from his, her field that gained national or broader success in her, his field of expertise. Today, the academy consists of 24 studios which are grouped within five departments, architecture, design, fine arts, applied arts, and graphics. The sixth department provides lectures on art theory, art history, and aesthetics. All departments and studios are in some way more or less connected through collaboration and the free passing of students from one into another studio during the course of exchange for one or more semesters. The tension, dispute, support, complementation, competition and reflections between applied and fine arts are constitutive elements of the academy and in a way from the function and character of the students and as well the academic agency. The choice of applicants is very selective. The applicants must undergo almost a week-long entering exams period, and a limited number of students are accepted to the first year per studio maximum from two to four students. At the Fine Art Department, the bachelor program lasts four years and two years of master program, but can vary slightly according to the department. 
Once the students are accepted, they become part of the small collective, maximum up to 25 students per studio, where they all meet regardless the year in which they currently are. To understand the specific features of the contemporary situation of this institution, it's important to understand the local context in a historical perspective. Following the 89 Velvet Revolution, the Czech art scene quite predictably attempted to emulate the Western standards of art production in all senses through education, exhibition mechanisms, competitions, awards, residency programs, etc. It was the notion to return to Europe of a sort and to catch up with developments and to participate in the current trends, to embark on the road from periphery more towards the center of the world institutional art industry. But attempts to adopt a new model ended up in a failure, since the local art did not have access to financial, institutional and neither educational resources slightly comparable to those in Western Europe. In the period of transition, the Academy took over the grassroots built art education infrastructure, so it seemed quite naturally that in this period of post-communist transformation and the subsequent years of accelerated consumerism and the rise of the new advertising trends, came the initiative to establish the studio of photography, which happened in the year 1994. Before we took the position in the 2008 together with Hinekalt, the studio had only two previous directions. One under the first pedagogue Pavel Sticha, based on extremely technical skills and regular practical assignments, and another one under the lead of Ivan Pinkova, who followed Sticha in the year 2005 and who more subjectively oriented the course of the studio with emphasis on artistic emotional photography. The studio photography belonged at first to the Department of Graphic Design and the change only happened in the year 2010 when we felt that the nature of students' creative processes under our guidance needed a transition into the fine art department. The students themselves showed interest, initiative and willingness to move from the applied art department to the fine arts department so that they could expand their creative making also beyond the photographic medium, focus more on contemporary thinking and get critical response from their peers and the pedagogues from the other fine arts studios. Today is the studio of photography one of the five studios under the fine art department together with the studios of sculpture, painting, intermedia practice and the visiting artist studio. The formal procedures in art that by the time we became active academics within the school became typical for the period and projected themselves into the education were the rediscovery of the heritage of conceptualism and performance art of the 60s, abandonment of traditional media, a tendency towards the materialization, intermediality, collaboration and interventions in existing social frameworks, concern with the social and political dimensions of artistic creation, a turn to the documentary and archival, the merging of the roles of artist, curator and theorist and the advance for the collective work. During the period from 2008 until 2016, when we taught together with Hinek, many changes happened in the structural sense of the department. Besides the change for the fine art department, there were many changes related to the medium photography alone. We like to use the term hidden river to describe the character of the studio, which represented the metaphor of the set of phenomena, meaning by that a group of students, development of photography, utopia of educational process, local and global trends that is in constant motion, which is sometimes very clearly easy to describe. At other times, however, this motion is indistinctly mixed with movements in various directions. Sometimes this flow is only known of, but it is not possible to see it. Works that originated within that period proved how the topics themselves and the students' methods of creation are linked, mutually penetrated and overlapping. Post-conceptual thinking was a collective base for most works where the idea remains the main axis of the work, but the attention of authors once again turns to the creation through a particular material. Work is again an artifact within photography with frequent overlaps into other media like video, installation or sculpture. 
We understood the direction of the studio where photography served not as a mandatory and unquestionable medium, but as a base of a broader consideration, as a basic definition that many works exceeded or denied. With Hinek, we established a teaching method that was based on our agreement, as much as on our disputes that could serve as a content for the students. We understood the studio as a community of people with a shared interest in how contemporary art can co-create, act, portray, experience and imagine the world. In the year 2017, I reapplied for the position to run the studio together with the young Czech artist Martin Kohout living in Berlin. The studio concept, interaction with students and Martin's art practice, who is based in video and 3D technologies, naturally expanded photographic media into another media like video and for the works related in the digital environment. Our goal is to reflect this shift in the teaching itself and in how we look at the role of photographic and moving images and records, ways of their creation and generation, distribution, manipulation, impact or archiving. We apply a laboratorial system of teaching, which pursues the mutual influencing of the individual structures of art. We reflect contemporary artistic and theoretical discourse, but also attempt to update and add new articulation to the list of existing photographic approaches. We believe that the penetrability of the boundaries of individual genres and media has already been established and we value the expanded field of photography. We therefore want to focus more on gaps in the understanding of the image, on exploring the possibilities of photography in its widest sense and on what role it may play in contemporary life and art and what are its benefits, stereotypes and limitations for social engagement. We acknowledge photography in all its forms. Currently, there are photo and video media, which fundamentally influence the relationship to the issues of original and copy, question of authorship, physical realization and its virtual resources, or the speed with which their digital copies spread in many different qualities, resolutions or modified versions. However, a new need for materiality appeared in the digital age. Young artists want to work manually, they want to touch things, they want to knead and to shape. This is a new element which enables photography to become a spatial installation. Students want to manually interfere with the process of work and it doesn't matter if the photograph is only a trace or insignificant element of a final product. That could be a metal construction covered in textile, but the referential point could still be photography. In the educational process, we translate contents through diverse mental concepts. Visual images can be translated to text. Text can be translated to drawing. Drawing can be translated to matter and mass. And mass can be translated back to a photograph. The most important thing is the working process, much more than the final product. However, the final product is also important as it is the litmus paper of all previous processes. We are surrounded by photographic images like never before. Haron Faroqi's film Still Life from 1997 reflects on the phenomenon of still life genre by depicting it throughout art history. The film is divided into four chapters using static still life painting of Dutch masters, while we follow from the beginning to the end the process of creation of four technically master photographs from different time periods in four different professional photographic studios. In each of the chapters, we follow the work of the photographer without any commentary and their assistance, while we can hear requirements and comments of the art director or a client along. The film slowly describes, almost in real time, the demanding work of the photographer and the need for everyone's cooperation involved. The photographer is the main character here, the professional who controls the devices, has experience with handling the light and various light-sensitive materials. He's a master in his field. Although the film is not even 20 years old, it depicts, from today's point of view almost nostalgically, the epoch, machines, environment and social situation which no longer exists. Beer advertising is still being photographed in a similar way, but the technology and position of the photographer are changing so fast that it is not at all strange to think that it will not be so soon. Analogy At the end of a science fiction film Holy Motors from 2014 by French director Leo Scarax, the main character recalls an era when the cameras were bigger than the people who operated them. 
they gradually shrank and automate and now in the film in the near future they are already so small that they are not visible anymore. Part 9 One of the interesting transformations that brought the dissemination of photographs through various social networks like Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, WhatsApp is bringing a photo closer to the spoken word. Photo is not selected from the phone's storage, but is created directly in the publication. It mediates momentary emotions, it transmits the information and after the expiration of the press preset interval, it destroys itself so that it cannot be saved. Photography has changed from a stable, material, unique object to an instant, ephemeral, virtual object. The internet is a space full of constantly emerging photographs, unanchored images moving across the internet. They change their location for a while, they temporarily become a part of another networks, create and break ties, co-create discourse, copy are interconnected by keywords and then they disappear. Hito Starr, in a lecture on the politics of photography, talks about new synthetic photographs that the new smartphones will soon be taking them and where the image of reality is just the basis for the synthesis of data from already finished photos stored on the phone or on any social networks. This leads us to believe that we absolutely cannot anticipate the technological de development of photography nor its social consequences. In the studio we meet students that we cannot force to accept our understanding of the medium or our ideas of its future. It is our duty to enable them to create their own broad, informed and critical awareness of contemporary art which they will further be able to use, develop or apply themselves and where photography plays the role of an ideal starting line or reference point which can be approached or move away from. Conclusion Photography will be here with us in the future, but we don't know how it will look like. In today's dynamic development of visual technologies, it is precisely thinking about photography, the thinking about the margin between the present and the future. So the further video uh, will be the presentation of Dmitry Bielinski and his uh, friends initiative and school. And uh, for me, it was interesting to see the, how the good school was uh, orientated on a local knowledge uh, and nourishing the, the local knowledge in a, in a group um, and transferring that knowledge to, to a public or to the individuals. I found interesting that somehow the the photography in a in a Czech context context is something already uh, part of the our tacit knowledge. Let's say that the the photography in Prague is somehow kind of a local technology, which I think uh, Sasha and um, her colleagues have somehow interesting attacking and criticizing. So the next video uh, will be the presentation of the school which is uh, somehow found uh, by the people who are standing as, as Dmitri said in the video outside of the normalization so so there is something very different from the institutional point of view uh, the school of engaged art in St. Petersburg uh, was founded uh, in 2013 by the Stodielat collective after many years of works with various temporary educational projects in the field of uh, contemporary art, activism, performance, and theory. Uh, their artistic method is based on the emphasis on the educational value of art for the development of people. The transition to the permanent educational institution is important for them as an opportunity to form a new artistic environment in St. Petersburg. Um, since 2013, the school has realized four student enrollments for one-year training courses, as well as two advanced studies learning programs. And during seven years uh, period of school activity, more than 100 participants from a different cities of Russia and ex-Soviet republics took part in its diverse practices. So Dmitry's videos 
we'll start with the introduction of the history, how the academic environment in, in Russia, Moscow and St. Petersburg has changed and why they uh, found, founded the school. So let's see the further video, thanks. Hello, my name is Dmitry Vilensky. I am member of Studiality Collective from St. Petersburg. And today in my talk, I would like to speak about our experience of our School of Engaged Art in St. Petersburg. So my talk will be structured in three parts and I would like to dedicated to Marion von Austin, who was my, how to say, informal teacher and by whom I learned a lot. She died last week. And first part, uh, I call it Forming Unreformed and I would like to share my vision about situation with art education in Russia and especially give you background of that formal kind of academic structure which we actually have in Russia. <laughs> but let's see how it looks like. So we have system of academies um, which has a genealogy from Tsaris time. Before revolution, it even called as imperial art academies, mm. Imperatorske Akademie Iskust. It's more like royal art academies all over Europe, which has still the same name. And for a short period of time after revolution, mm, it was taken over by artists of Soviet avant-garde, but already at the beginning of the 30s, uh, with Stalinism started purges and in established the doctrine of socialist realism and then the whole academy kind of stagnated and well, purified from any traces of modernism and avant-garde spirit. At the moment of perestroika, for complexity of reasons, the leader of so-called unofficial art in Soviet Union somehow failed to take over this institution, which was actually like the look back quite serious problem for the whole development of art scene in Russia after Perestroika. And it didn't happen like in most countries as far as I know in Eastern Bloc or Baltic Republic. It was quite quickly the power came from that conservative elite into new one. But in Russia not. We can ask why, but the proper analysis of this process would run us far away when it really need a serious talk why it happened. But briefly to say, first of all, it was quite an attractive fight to take over this institution. First of all, they were so badly financed and actually at this moment when Soros Ford Foundation came to Russia, for many ex-unofficial artists was pretty much more easy to establish some of their own institution or educational program and get proper paid, but not take over the academies. Also demands a lot of kind of efforts and bureaucratic work, which many artists were not ready to make. And also, one of the maybe major factor was that most of really serious figure of Moscow conceptualism and from St. Petersburg, they simply left country and went to the West where they have open, brilliant perspective of participating in exhibition life and selling their works, having galleries. So there was actually no one <laughs> who could actually take this role. Yeah. And so, 
So the 90s to beginning of 2000, the academies was actually full of old professors who keep on the teaching process of mastering craft of painting and sculpture and mosaic and murals, almost non-paid, but at the same time they kept their kind of symbolic mission. And also makes sense to mention that it was certain demand by young people, especially not only in St. Petersburg and Moscow, but in the province, to come to this academy and actually learn this old craftsmanship. <laughs> so, and because actually they believe in how to say in that kind of sacral genius character of artistic work and it gives them certain skills which help to earn some money and get some jobs and funny to know that very quickly Russian art academies became in demand of Chinese students who came here to learn how to make fake paintings from realist to abstract ones and still up to 70% of our academic academies are occupied by the students who pay serious money to learn this important profession. Right now with pandemic uh, most of them <laughs> go back to home and right now I imagine that there is a deep economic crisis in these academies without Chinese students. And we also should um, reflect that the beginning of 2000 happened with the Putinism new ideological turn and um, the conservatives start to play a big role and this kind of new version of socialist reali realism also helped for new ideological goal, like to paint official portraits or do some mosaic for private homes or public commission for metro station and repaint churches and so on. So our academic system has no interest for reforming and integrate the basic protocols of criticality, modernism and deschooling which is also intact with this general situation in Russia where we don't have much space for critical positions and different marginal or uh, oppositional voices are silenced and repressed. But at the same time, situation is not homogeneous and new generation of young people who are coming from liberal families have deep have been demanding contemporary art and the new infrastructure for representation of contemporary art. And this system demands new artists which need to be taught and led into establishing few educational initiatives which are trying to close this gap. And they have already educated new generations of young artists who some of them quite present internationally but not many. And they operate as experimental educational platforms, mostly established by artists who are committed to this mission. Of course, this initiative can hardly match the high standard of a proper academic education and training, but at the same time they can produce vibrant artistic communities and engaged public, who together create a situation where contemporary art becomes popular and even, I would say, marginally fashionable, like in Moscow. So they are mostly in Moscow, but at the same time there are a few initiatives outside Moscow, like our ones, and yeah, as I mentioned, they really trying to bring quite highest uh, contemporary trends and international trends, and also very interesting that most of people who take this initiative like me. So we are not educated, we are not product of proper academic schooling. Once I was talked to Claire Bischoff, uh, who actually told me, Dmitry, <laughs> this schooling is not for you because you've never been properly schooled. And it's true. And this kind of living outside of that any type of normalization provides certain kind of a freedom freedom 
to come from the back door <laughs> and take certain advantages of maybe sometimes naive but at the same time very sincere and actually most of things in Russian life I would say is uh, structured quite opposite to the West or so-called West I mean that Russian life based on scarcity scarcity of resources scarcity of people scarcity of um, also micro and macro catastrophes which permanently unfolding and so on and yeah it's very unproductive for normalized history as normal progress and in my third part I will criticize the idea of progress especially now but show us that quite exciting for making some breaks and some I hope serious experiments so yeah and through this i hope we somehow manage to contribute to the general radical experiments and this permanent crisis of contemporary art so this was part one second part on the history of school of engaged art or to school or not to school. Our school exists already for seven years. We started in 2013 and it was very dramatic time. You we immediately run into a situation of war in Ukraine, annexation of Crimea, economic collapse and economic sanctions against Russia. So and it also comes hand in hand with a growing repression and new repressive laws on social and political life in Russia and repression of opposition. So yeah, it was traumatic experience and I would say that we as an artist, as a collective and personally managed to survive through these years only because we have support of that growing community of the school with whom we shared our anxiety and our resistance. Looking back, I can say it was also a very exciting time, full of a kind of catastrophic revelation and adventures. Our school is not safe space, but it's a space where all partitions all participants are really care about each other as a comrades and it's not about who is more talented or not talented it's about developing certain human quality which allow you to live in dignity we never ask an open call when we enroll people to the school to about proper portfolio we only ask about their motivation and we don't ask why they want to become artists we ask them why art is important for them why it's important for you and what art can do for society in our desperate situation so let's see this old already historic short video reel which include text of original school manifesto from 2013. Не, у нас же на акции... А, у меня Ази сегодня утром э, говорит, ты оценил, как мы Голубина водили? И когда там на... Ну, мы там лекции слушали, они же там водили Голубей за собой, поднимали их на сцену, потом гоняли, потом опять... Что? Дети, дети, дети гоняли. Румянцев. А -а -а. Они не гоняли их, они их водили. Они их водили а, и устраивали а, им перку. Да? Да? А, Голубин, Голубин. Голубин и перку с ним устраивали. А, Голубин и перку. Это черный квадрат. Да, 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 кстати. Это, кстати, интересно. Экскурсия для Голубин. 
Франция для голубей, это вообще радикально. Имени Франциска Ассиси. Музей имени Франциска Ассиси. Когда такие голуби ходят, да? Да, да, да. да, да, да. А они так и Нет, ходят. А это дико, они дико так и ходят. Если их вот так вот на это самое, Прикарь. на хлебочек взять, то... Интересно, потому что мы сейчас обсуждаем кафе в духе Франциска Ассиси. Здесь? Да. Да? Как вариант, типа, сделать большого голуби или еще что-то. Да. И кормушка так будет нереально, круто, и прикармливать. Нет, нет, нет. Кормушка для людей. Кормушка для людей. А голуби там могут прийти и выпить ну, что-нибудь да, нормально. Это организовано нормальное питание. Здоровье. Меню такое. Да. То есть здесь кормушка для людей. Барное меню опять. Здесь кормушка для людей. Пьяный голуби валяется под столом. Ой, это охранник вечер говорит. Ребята, давайте, хорошо привели время, теперь в кровать, давайте. Мне интересно, если кормушки будут везде стоять для всех, да? Голубей, котов, собак, люди. Слушайте, а вот это радикально, кстати. Вчера мы показывали для всех, для нас. Для всех, блин, для всех. Интересно, я подумал, что фильм снять Кстати, для голубя. Сняли новости уже про голуби. Нет, нет, про голуби. Нет, для голубя. Для Такой голуби. червяк, там сущий червяк. Парина. Это сразу субъект объект, знаешь. Да, на открытии. На открытии сделать фуршет для всех из кормушек. Расставить кормушки. Да. И кормушка, кормушка так будет нереально, да. круто, и прикармливать. Да, да. Нет, нет, нет. Кормушка для людей. Кормушка для людей. Кормушка для людей. Кормушка для людей. А голуби там могут прийти и выпить ну, да, что-нибудь нормально. Это организовано нормальное питание. Да. Меню такое. Да. То есть здесь кормушка Барные для людей. Барное меню опять. Здесь кормушка для людей. Пьяные голуби валяются под столом. Ой, это охранник вечер говорит. Ребята, давайте, хорошо привели время, теперь в кровать, давайте. Мне интересно, если кормушки будут везде стоять для всех, да? Голубей, котов, собак, люди. Слушайте, а вот это радикально, кстати. Потом мы вчера показывали для всех, для нас. Для всех, блин, для всех. Я подумал, что фильм снять для голубя. А сняли новости уже про голубей. Нет, нет, про голубей. Нет, для голубя. Такой червяк, там сущий червяк. Марина. Это сразу субъект объект, знаешь. Да, надо сделать. На открытии сделать фуршет для всех из кормушек. Расставить кормушки. Классная идея, мне очень. Очень хорошая. Как-то развивается. Не, я думаю, там пойдет. На самом деле, обычно прорыв идет там за дней за пять, когда вдруг все А потом, когда сядем, мы будем обсуждать, как будет. Part number three. Art education in limbo. Learning with the virus. There was a chance that art could celebrate the pandemic as a unique chance to get rid of stability and jump into unknown. As many people did say, the pandemic just accelerated a certain tendencies which were already here. But despite our endless courses on post and non-human agency, deep ecology and so on, it happened that education and in particular art education was not prepared at all for this serious assault. Art academies cut off access to the studios for their students. The classrooms moved, shifted into digital space and students start to be afraid to use streets or parks for their activity. Art practice was always adventure, a journey into unknown, to shape something which not yet exists. Or it was already with us, but people need some navigation to discover it. Such modernist practice often did happen in the midst of revolution or social turmoil. Actually, the whole century between Paris Commune and Perestroika in Soviet Union was permanent radical changes and catastrophes. 
All our art is made after this or that type of disaster, especially now when the acknowledgement that all history of the progress is a history of catastrophe became not just the marginal knowledge of Benjamin fan club, but the knowledge of the street. But with the virus, we stay perplexed and lost in many possible ways, with a growing feeling that there is no way back to normality, which we have so much criticized before pandemic. And this situation seriously and dramatically challenged our education system, from elementary school to the universities. What is the community of learners would mean nowadays? The situation is overcomplicated because we face all-round crisis. It's not just about pandemic with its unresolved and tragic circumstances. Most likely, we have been entering a series of catastrophic situations which provoke by human activity, but the novelty is that now they are developing with intervention of so-called non-human agents. It can be COVID or new viruses, and of course the serious danger of climate change which is completely unpredictable, interference in our everyday life. So, this situation sending us kind of a signals which we can't recognize and decipher because we lost our system of usual coordinates. It comes together with a growing psychological crisis when our classrooms are transforming into healing rooms of spaces of personal and collective therapy. The psychological damage, especially for young generation, is already enormous. I, we feel it in our school and through the talks with other pedagogues and teachers, so it's a real problem which we face and it's one of the urgent ones. Also the gap, the mental state of different generations is rapidly growing. The so-called boomer-zuma crisis interfered dramatically into that kind of type of intergenerational education model. These changes and economic disaster, which definitely creates the redistribution of funds for artistic activity and obviously lead into its scarcity and growing competition, also demands a serious transformation of the whole idea of what art should be. And we'll see right now the shift of art practice into direction of reproductive work, care, healing, therapy, community building. And this turn already shift the whole convention of art making, its education, distribution, and particular evaluation, which actually very much belongs to possibility of education. What do we teach and what kind of educational program and institution do we need during pandemic, which could help us to enter post-pandemic time in kind of proper shape? What kind of activity our society will demand from art practice? We don't know this question yet, that's why we are so kind of in limbo. But we should continue our practice together with new generations and overcome despair, anxiety, and be open to whatever comes. We can learn and practice new form of, I like this word, diplomacy with all dangerous agents trying to escape direct confrontation and situation of the war as rhetoric we often hear now, and learn how to respect unknown. Then there is a chance that we manage to facilitate new, non-repressive, engaged, local, sensitive, trembling, sustainable forms of life to come. Art is also a virus, as you remember from favorite songs and books, and we need to consciously participate in its mutation. That's why at this moment we initiated a new program, it's quite international one, with the Institute of Radical Imagination, which we call the School of Mutation, and together we manage to survive and rescue some crucial ideas of human emancipation and communion. Thank you so much and hope it will be discussion around all that 
raising issues. Thank you. Thanks for Dmitri presentation. And the final, final video uh, is done prepared by Pavel Wichler. And uh, it is from my point of view, interestingly critical towards academic industri industrialization. So I will at the end uh, try to somehow post the questions which will maybe summarize the, the motive we, we heard. So I will just briefly introduce Pavel Bichler. He's an artist, influential teacher, and occasional writer and curator, born in Prague, where he studied the School of Graphics, Arts, and the Institute of Applied Arts in the 70s, in the 1970s. He came to Britain in uh, 1981 and co-founded Cambridge Dargum Gallery, and he was uh, also head of uh, School of Fine Art at Glasgow School of Art, and uh, research professor in art and Manchester Metropolitan University. Since the mid 80s, Bichler has exhibited in Britain and across continental Europe, as well as China, Australia, and America. More recently, he had an uh, institutional solo exhibition at the Spengel Museum, Museum Hanover, an icon uh, gallery, Birmingham, and participated in several group projects, including Biennale Giardemia in 2020. Il Ritmo de Spazio Museo della Grafica Pisa 2019. Uh, so I will just ask uh, our friends to, to play Pavel's video and then we shortly briefly open the discussion. Thanks. I think if we can, without moving the chairs, clear all this stuff away and I will finish the, and I will finish the second half an um, The topic of this symposium is phrased as a question. I will not try to answer the question. Rather, I will look from uh, a perspective in the United Kingdom where I live and where I have taught for over 30 years uh, at the history uh, of the question. I will also pay attention uh, to language because language and its use is really uh, at the heart of the reform and it is also perhaps today the one thing that we still teach at art schools. So, the question is, how do you approach the teaching of art under the existing institutional conditions and reformed educational policies? The invitation letter further elaborated on what is meant by reform by describing a two-stage development over the last 50 years, whereby first, the influence of new forms of contemporary art since the 1970s has brought into question the necessity of cultivation of traditional crafts and skills in fine art education. And second, a range of theories imported more recently from the fields of social sciences, cultural studies, linguistics, etc., has gradually expanded the critical discourse of art both in and outside educational institutions and potentially brought into question the relevance or even appropriateness of specialist art education for the education of artists. Although in general these two stages and the associated institutional reforms cannot be neatly separated, it seems to me that they have pushed and pulled the culture and identity of art education in opposite directions. And it may be that in addressing the question of how we teach or should teach, we should focus our attention precisely on the tension that this opposing movement has created. Do we ignore it or acknowledge it? Is it a problem? Is it an opportunity? What can we do with it? How can we use it creatively? The first stage of the development was characterized by a shift from the authority of the medium and its conventions towards a spirit of a new freedom of experimentation bordering on anarchy. 
At least until the 1970s, art education in the UK had always looked into the past rather than the future. It had lacked in its methods and ethos behind its subject. Following the developments in art form from safe distance, assimilating and internalizing new models and positions once they have become established or already abandoned and consigned to history. But when its retrospective outlook was confronted with the disintegration of the classical paradigm of isms, discernible trends, styles and tendencies, and with the advent of new forms of art that did not conform to any established historical models, art education had to face what the American futurologist Alvin Toffler called at the time the future shock. Toffler argued that education must shift into the future tense in order to keep pace with the relentless pressure of technological innovation and the scale of social and cultural change, which accelerates the obsolescence of specialist knowledge, skills and qualifications, and leads to the need for constant retraining. Experience loses its advantage over adaptability, Toffler wrote and we should expect that a half of what we are learning will be outdated by the time we learn it. Consequently, the task of learning must be to learn how to learn, unlearn and relearn. In any case, almost any of the manifestations of the new contemporary art that emerged in the 1970s demanded the skilling rather than craft. This challenge, on the one hand, opened the scope for art education as a creative activity in its own right, and on the other, it seems to have very little to teach. As the formal criteria of technique, process, and the exercise of skill that used to differentiate the work of artists from other material and intellectual production became unreliable, an attitude became more important than competence as the prerequisite of an artistic practice. As a result, an art school became a place where attitudes were shaped no longer by the vertical transfer of know-how from the master teacher to the student, but by the horizontal process of social interaction. Kasper Koenig, one of the pioneer art school reformers, insightfully observed that the most important facility of the 1970s art school was the student bar and the most important formative experiences of a student were the conversations in it. As he summed it up uh, at an art education conference in Southampton in 1995, if it hadn't been for the excellent bar at St. Martin's, there wouldn't have been rock and roll in Britain. The significance of this remark will become apparent shortly. The traditionally conservative UK art education responded initially and quite quickly to the future shock by trying to bypass the problem and contain the new contemporary art practices in what used to be called the third area, which is, I suppose, the antecedent of what is now called at this academy intermedia. In some institutions, such arbitrarily defined areas coexisted and continue to coexist in a happy mutual ignorance alongside the skill-based instruction and learning in the individual arts, from painting and sculpture to such things as leatherwork and bookbinding. But in the most, the traditional subjects gave way to the new means of contemporary art, and there is by now an established, if unspoken, premise that in fine art, specialist skills are something to be learned with critical skepticism, if at all, and then mostly left behind. Their main value may be that they give students something to unlearn in the future. I remember visiting a photography course uh, where I was an external examiner sometime in the mid-1980s, where none of the 40 plus graduating students actually made any photographs. The first stage of the reform changed above all the way we talked about what we did. It brought into art education a host of new key concepts and terms. One of them was the word practice, which exemplified a position or an attitude rather than any productive activity. Another, quite surprisingly, was the word art, 
which brought in a distinction between the making of paintings or sculptures and doing things. Up until then, uh, art belonged to art as a generic term, belonged to history and to the future outside the academy. Inside the academy, students were practicing in the dual sense of observing the rule and honing the necessary skills of the particular arts, painting, sculptures, etc. Now, alongside making artifacts, they were doing art. By doing art, the students became artists. This feature of the first stage of the reform is perhaps more significant than we tend to think for there is no parallel in the rest of the tertiary education. Nowhere else but among art students. Do students identify with their future occupations or professional identities? And although only a mi minority of the students perhaps ever pursue careers uh, in art, at an art school they are all artists. And finally, a school of art became an art school. Art before the school, as one of my colleagues at Glasgow School of Art uh, used to like to say. What are you doing here? 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 You can always rely on John Baldessari, a great teacher, uh, to make uh, the point perfectly. So while the first stage of the reform brought contemporary artistic practice into art education, the second stage exposed that practice to the gradual integration of theory. Already in the 1970s, conceptual art introduced art students to Ludwig Wittgenstein and neo-Marxism as if to fill a void in the curriculum created by the fact that there being no generally accepted criteria for what constituted a work of art, there could be no unifying theory of art either. Later on, in the 1980s, when the first cohorts of graduates of the Reformed Art School entered the teaching profession and became teachers, they brought with them such things as semiology, psychoanalysis, the critical theory of the Frankfurt School, and a few others. Soon after, postmodernism finally displaced the last essays by Panofsky and Greenberg from the reading lists. And although little of this was ever actually taught, let alone absorbed, it was met with a degree of enthusiasm, at least by the conceptually leaning part of the art school population, because the introduction of theory seemed to give some intellectual dignity and authority to artistic practice, which by then was commonly referred to by such words as inquiry or investigation. In the UK, this coincided with a dramatic structural change in tertiary education, where polytechnics, which had hosted most of the art and design provision, were forcibly transformed into the so-called post-1992 universities, and virtually all smaller independent art colleges were wiped off the map, leading the way to what has by now become a large corporate industry. At first, the impact of this change on teaching and on doing art was not great. This was partly because the physical infrastructure remained the same. The same building, the same studio, the same workshop with the same technician in it. So when the art school became a faculty or a department or a unit or a subject cluster, it didn't seem like a big deal. But the new institutions soon began to impose on art education their own academic conventions and concepts. 
The most impactful of these have been research and the introduction of doctoral study and PhD qualifications, which by now have become the precondition of employment in the artistic industry. Since from the perspective of the institutions and the funding bodies for the so-called artistic research, a quote, a work of art cannot stand on its own as a research output, the relative value of art making has been diminished. In the new forms of academic art that have begun to emerge in and from the academic setting, such concepts as research methodology are now as much a required component of practice as the making skills once used to be. And although studio practice still dominates the fine art curriculum, for the university, the dominant academic form is writing, the dominant mode is theory, the dominant product is information, and the ruling principle is academic equivalence. This new environment for art education promotes in a new disguise an obsolete art educational paradigm. It is a return to an obsession with essential skills and methods and common standards of competence, except that these are no longer specifically artistic. These new methods are now the methods of production, are not the methods of production, but of evaluation. And the new study skills on the whole serve no other purpose than to help the student through the obstacle course of their university degree. Yet even if artist teachers now call themselves academics and researchers, and even if their products have become research outputs rather than works, art students are still artists and they still do art. But if a student in John Baldessari's class at CalArts in 1970s would have replied to John's question, I am doing art, today the reply at a UK university would probably be something like, my research is concerned with the issues of dot, 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 or my practice investigates this and that. Language and its uses are indeed what we teach and learn at art school. But it seems that today, in a UK university art department, the language is no longer ours. It reproduces and copies the generic language of the academic discourse and presents a picture of an activity grounded in institutional priorities and interests. Or to rephrase Kasper Koenig's observation, if a PhD had been introduced at St. Martin's in 1976, there would be no rock and roll in the UK. Uh, the, among the great, possibly the greatest, among the great innovators of the first wave of the reform were Charles Harrison and the artist group Art and Language, who then taught at the Norwich School of Art. Uh, let's hear what they have to say on the point. Thank you. It is a T C E to regard language as a classless means of communication. Language belongs to the managers. Thank you for the final, final <coughs> video from Pavel Bichler and I will slowly open the discussion. Thank you all for your great contributions. Uh, I just forgot to introduce myself at the very beginning. I'm uh, Dusan Zahoranski and I'm with my wife uh, teaching or leading the intermediate studio at the A Academy of Fine Art here in Prague and also I'm responsible for uh, study affairs. So I'm one of the uh, manager board member. And uh, so these four contributions were very, very somehow important for me because I, I like uh, many, many 
uh, problems uh, which were somehow defined or questioned there. So my uh, somehow summary is that there is a somehow common uh, common ground that the art education or the or the also the independent initiative as a school of engaged art and good school are uh, also kind of infrastructure for uh, lifelong learning and unlearning. So if we quit the, the word art, so I found uh, somehow the, the common, common point of all four uh, contributions that they were dealing, defining the infrastructure, which somehow is created uh, already in history, like uh, here in Prague, like Alexandra's uh, example, the School of Applied Arts, uh, in Prague, which is already something like 100 years old, or on the contrary, there are very fresh and young initiative like Good School and School of English Art. So there is this this uh, topic of inf infrastructure, which has uh, several layers, uh, several tools, where the participants or uh, or collective or students or uh, let's say these these people who who took part in the in the process meet and discuss discuss the topic so there is from my point of view kind of personal level where each uh, participant has a somehow privacy to explore the the problematics of art uh, in a very wide range uh, in his very private perspective so there is another layer is a kind of social interaction within within the individuals and there is a kind of uh, intellectual, uh, uh, critical, uh, kind of healthy pressure on the on the on the what on what's happening in the school uh, from the kind of outside guests, uh, theoreticians, as as it was mentioned in Pavel Bichler's presentation uh, with the with the example how the the theory. Uh, Inter uh, came came or somehow attacked the academic systems and became one of the tools. So my my question is um, also at the at the very end there is the 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 the, the term emancipa emancipation, like kind of goal of the institution is to provide emancipation for the for those who are uh, involved. And my question is maybe to first to MJ Pringotono uh, that if this uh, uh, not artifact driven education as, as it is in a classical academies, but more attitude driven education, what, what are the tools to somehow evaluate the, the progress or the uh, development of the, of the attitude of of those who are involved. Because if we have an artifact, uh, we can say, okay, the colors are too bright, the, the, the face is not the correct, or the stone is carved roughly, or it's not polished enough. So within this field, there are certain criteria. but of course we, we are uh, operating in a different different environment. So what, what, is, what are the kind of evaluation tools for the attitude-driven uh, education. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the question. Uh, talking about good school, actually, we have also uh, talked about years, years before, because it's uh, developed by three collectives. It's a very different focus. Uh, uh, one is Huang Rupa. I think you already know what Huang Rupa is, uh, what they are uh, record. And also there is a serum. Myself is from a collective uh, serum, more focused in uh, questioning about the, what happened in uh, art pedagogy. So uh, that's uh, also uh, the reason why now we come we come here, and also there is another collective is Grafisuruhara is more focused in medium, which is uh, 
uh, graphic so it's printing so over, over year we learn each other like Herum learn from Ruang Rupa and also so on. We uh, sometimes we help their festival, their exhibition and everything. When we are have a workshop, they are invite uh, us as an individual, also as a collective to join working together. So after years, uh, uh, there is uh, our project in Denmark that we call it uh, a collective is a school. So we invite many, many collectives come in, join in the focus group discussion and offer this uh, statement about the collective is cool. We want to, is it right when you are going to collective, it's the same like you are going to school. Because uh, uh, what we found is, is there is a two reason people going to school only two reasons. The first one is only uh, to know so they can do things. And the re another reason is, the second reason is to enter the ecosystem in every field. But in the fact, we found that you can now, you can know things without going to school right now. The knowledge is and there's also people can enter easily enter the collective and become someone like that Just because only inside the in, inside the ecosystem so it's also what happened in in people like me and other uh, member in a good school right now they come from very variative uh, discipline uh, and then uh, some of them are sorry, yes, they are uh, also study in uh, art school, but some of them are not, but they also can become an artist in art school, uh, in good school. So now actually what we found is uh, we know that uh, the education model in art school is to challenge individual to come up with the idea and the institution of art schools always asking the originality as individual ideas. But in good school, what we challenge is how come, how can you can share the credit, how come or how can you uh, uh, share the ideas into the table and it's become like uh, uh, belong to everyone there. And, and the idea can grow more and more and become what we are imagined uh, together. But of course, we, we also still believe that individual is a matter because every collective is also deep, depend with the members who, who they are uh, individually, what can they can do because there was the, their resource, very important one. So uh, to answer the, the question about how we evaluate uh, in the video, uh, we, we try to describe uh, the hangout idea uh, the hangout model as our methodology to working together to sharing the idea and distribution the knowledge because it's happened what it's happened in in culturally uh, culturally in indonesia uh, hangout is very uh, very daily life to it's also to answer that what we can found in in uh, in a normal education, in, uh, in uh, for example, it's quite late actually that the, our formal education in in art school in university are uh, talking about the curatorial tip. So 
like for example ruang rupa then make the workshop to to challenge the idea of the uh, the curatorship in 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 indonesia and then university try to open it then there's one sample and uh, yes because why we do the hangout uh, as our model of methodology because in hangout is there is a freedom people join and out there is no there's independency each people to comfort with this uh, group this new uh, community to sharing with so it's more like a natural evaluation actually what we really happen and and the first thing what we do is always trying to understand everyone there that's why even we are working collectively but uh, individual we, we also uh, um, uh, appreciate that what they are interest with what they are really uh, want to do or not what they are capable with this or not so yeah, I, I, go on, go on. yeah yeah uh, yeah it's often the also come and go people in the collective the, that was natural and sometime for example in my collective uh, there is someone who want to go uh, out from the collective actually we really uh, uh, push them to go because uh, we also thinking that when they are going to someone else or focus or working or more another uh, things, someday they will come back again and then share that knowledge. That's uh, also interesting for us. Yeah, yeah Dmitri wants to react, thanks. Yeah, actually I was inspired by panel talk and actually how to evaluate uh, attitudes doesn't matter that we know from 60s that attitudes becomes form often but for us right now i think one of the major evaluation those who manage to make rock and roll and you feel it <laughs> actually if you have in the class people who make rock and roll you are super happy that's yeah. it <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I also like the the Ringotono uh, comment on what what that the, the focus in on on what the people bring to the table and how they share the the, the knowledge they they have or they they have. So so I think it is a kind of different attitude to to evaluate uh, the result in, uh, is one thing and to evaluate the the manner how. Uh, personal or individual is sharing his own knowledge and how how somehow skilled in it he is so that's uh, interesting point and maybe I want to ask uh, Alexandra because I think that in her presentation uh, there is for for me kind of interesting uh, it was a very dynamic in a way passionate uh, collage of of the deconstruction of photography so. I, I felt like all those young people are really uh, destroying the photography from the different points. So, uh, but at the same time, we are in the context of a, of a kind of comfortable uh, post-Soviet uh, 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 Republic with a kind of established cultural institution. So we are living in a, in a comfortable world, let's say. Uh, so I'm, I'm wondering, uh, how how the their uh, her students are dealing with with this comfort and and uh, what uh, what is uh, she using as a tool to to somehow bring the discomfort in in their in their life okay yes uh, thank you for question thank you for invitation to um, academy of fine arts in prague 
Um, yes, yeah, so uh, basically my, my uh, contribution in the video form, uh, I would understand it um, very much as a somehow archeological site. You know, you have all these layers of time or something or interests, um, paradigms, um, circumstances, uh, group of people, everything is projected in this. Uh, and to answer maybe directly your question would be uh, in a way that um, I think at the moment um, the teaching changed into um, uh, establishing or creating the situations which are very um, unstable uh, or completely confusing the group of people uh, what's going on like and as well admitting that someone who is supposed to pre represent an authority is actually on the same level as they are students basically not knowing where we are going and i think this is something to completely um destabilize what as what you said yeah this is destabilization because uh coming from some kind of like a secondary kind of education moment there are so um they are like already, they, they learned how to execute things. You know, you give them a task, they fulfill, they get the grades, they are evaluated and they progress, yeah? So, and for them, this is some kind of like, and this is something we are trying to subvert entirely. Like basically you, you bring some kind of situation and you, don't, and you don't know what's gonna happen. And I have no idea what's gonna happen, you know? It's like Beckett moment, you know? Um, so uh, just to feel better, you know? like. <laughs> Or something like so. Yeah, this is my answer. Thank you. Thanks. I will maybe pass the word to to Dmitri, and uh, there I found uh, maybe somehow interesting the point of creating. Maybe it's also some of the, of the also uh, example of good school that to creating kind of shelter, but at the same time the shelter which doesn't hide, but the shelter that that provokes action. So uh, my question is, uh, uh, what somehow kind of institutional framework this shelter uh, could have? As for example, uh, as it was in good school, th there was this, this comment on, on uh, drinking a coffee and paying later, so that there is kind of friendly financial environment already, like within the community so so that the, even the money uh, somehow gets something softer so I think uh, uh, how, how to somehow strengthen this autonomy of the institution so it really become kind of a self-confident unit within uh, which can fight this normalization so how far how far we should go with with this autonomy complicated question uh, first if it's a shelter yeah I also talk about also the trendy notion of safe space and I told we are not safe space because this vulnerability especially in Russia and politically maybe it was a little bit unclear because you know our collective have quite mm, open oppositional let's say or maybe for you like in czech republic easy to understand as a kind of dissident different form of dissidence from activists who quite openly against putin to lgbt activists who are not welcome in the society most strongest movement right now i didn't tackle this issue it's about feminism actually right now i would say 90% of participants of the school are female. Like, I would say everywhere, but in right now in Russia, it's most interesting trend. And also what is also quite unique when you have three waves of feminism at once. You have first wave, second wave, and third wave, and new ones which are absolutely simultaneous, not like in the West, one grow after another in dialogue. No, they just exist. They're all present in your space, you know. 
So, yeah, I don't know. And especially, you know, also about social impact. For example, we always mm, ask why you use engaged art, but not socially engaged. We don't use socially engaged because we are socially unengaged. <laughs> because we don't know how to engage with this social which is completely hostile to your ideas. That's why, for example, you need to be a punk, you need to be untransparent in many ways, otherwise it will be simply destroyed. Even on the level of finance, for example, I can openly say that we finance from international sources, which is completely criminal in Russia. So you have to be really, really very smart to escape and at the same time continue your whatever you call mission you know so that's why it's somehow by default create a certain community which consider itself in a very specific position it's kind of confidential community of soviet dissidents who are absolutely obviously against the system trying to find a way to realize itself to become visible, but at the same time not to be repressed. Of course, some people get some fines for their action. It's not yet that brutal as it might be in Turkey or in Iran or in China where we have pure censorship. But at the same time, you know, it's really very um, shaky balance between what we want to say to society and impossibility to say because communication are cut. So we are kind of place where we keep this potentiality. So, and this potentiality, yeah, I would definitely go into more kind of bold action, but unfortunately we can't reach the people and they also don't want to take this risk. If they want, we try to support them, you know. So I don't know if I answer your question because yeah, it's certain, and also situation, what I wanted to say in my mm, uh, short presentation that for us situation is very quickly changed. It's not just about pandemic, but pandemic in Russia, it's different compared to pandemic in Czech Republic. It's very locally specific because there is no support from the state at all. So artists don't get, we discuss in the way how we can unionize alternatively, but it's very complex complex issues we failed at the moment but at the same time it's about that i'm completely surprised by the way how Rwan is operating in indonesia or oh, not Rwan, good school sorry i know more Rwan than good school actually i'm quite surprised but i guess at the moment internationally they much more open and have more kind of diverse platform which allows them to play through ngos and so on we in Russia, we don't have that opportunities right now, so to say. So even biggest donors which might come, they are absolutely impossible to get involved and without state help, yeah, it's very complicated. Sorry for that kind of <laughs> Yeah, thanks, thanks. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the term or the answer was described like from the several points. So I thank you. And uh, my final, like the question for this round will be to Pavel towards his uh, a criticism towards like artistic research and, and the industrialization of education that I found interesting that how, how, uh, how Pavel pointed at the terminology or the linguistics of how the, uh, the, the, the activities are named and structured linguistically and then uh, these linguistics uh, redefine or somehow determinates the practice. So, so it has this very dangerous, in a way, uh, like power. So, but my my question was that this uh, because from my point of view, the artistic research is somehow uh, or in our context uh, context uh, something as a counter uh, counter wave towards uh, like commercial artistic industrialization, like the artifacts industrialization. So that there is, uh, through the artistic research, uh, somehow there is an island where uh, artists can do their practice 
without entering the commercial field. So uh, I would like to ask Pavel what, what is his opinion when he really like experienced for many years the, the, the Western modern and the, the, the broad models of industrialization as, as I understand it. I can't quite, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, no, I can't quite uh, agree with your point. I think the uh, so-called artistic research as it is understood in the UK university environment is the most commercial thing you can imagine. In fact, the very reasons for why this is uh, not only prioritized, but kind of forced upon people to twist their practices into something that can be sold, quote unquote, as research is economic because research is where the education industry generates its income. And it's precisely one of those things that make me skeptical whether the university environment uh, is an environment uh, uh, that is kind of conducive to art education, not only in the kind of traditional sense of art education, the traditional sense, but any relevant model, you know, because uh, the university environment imposes a kind of standards of research in a sort of loose sense across all disciplines uniformly. And so uh, that sort of suppresses the value of artistic practice and indeed the value of the kind of you know, attitude or the kind of freeing of the, of the uh, creative space that the first wave of the art school reform, the introduction of contemporary art uh, into the art school brought about uh, and kind of reverses it back towards a very, very kind of um, uh, obsolete uh, uh, educational model, i.e. the old academic model for which I don't want to kind of elaborate on here. I think my little video said it's sufficiently. And, and this relates also to your first question uh, about evaluation. Evaluation is of course at the center of, or important anyway, uh, in any uh, pedagogic model, because evaluation basically means that you kind of, as a student and you know, as, as a participant, find out uh, what you are doing the John Baldessari question, what are you doing here? That's a kind of uh, question that, that, that triggers off the kind of process of at least self-evaluation. You have to know what you are doing. And again, the uh, university environment shifts that question towards uh, a kind of, or, 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 or uh, is likely, uh, to produce answers that are not kind of specific to the uh, 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 to the activities of art or art making or the identity of the artist, but uh, uh, in a direction where you seek the kind of justification for your uh, uh, work on the basis of some kind of generic academic uh, paradigm. Okay, thanks, thanks. Uh, yes, um, I don't have a brief reaction, but I, I uh, get, get uh, I mean, your comment, uh, which uh, somehow uh, summarized the, the problematics of uh, the um, criterias, which yeah. are projected over uh, somehow over the artistic field, which which is based on non non criteria, somehow the contra criteria. So I, I uh, get get uh, your. Uh, Can I just add something? Yeah. I'm not I'm not critical of artistic research as such. I think it provides an interesting model for something, but it certainly, in my view. It's not a form of defense against the commercialization of either education or the artistic practice. I think uh, potentially it could lead to a kind of re-establishing a certain type of new academic art, which could have its uses within the, within the institutional, within the academic environment. Uh, so I'm not critical of it per se. Uh, 
I am kind of skeptical about the uh, confusion between, uh, if you like, research and sort of creative freedom. Okay, thanks. And maybe I will have one last question and then I will let you and the, the those who are following the, the discussion. But there was also comment in Dmitri and possibly also in Pavel's uh, contribution, I found that there, there was kind of uh, nostalgic criticism towards the p passive attitude of, of a certain generation that they allowed, uh, for example, in, in Russia, and I think also it happened in a certain, in a different context in Czech Republic and Slovakia, that, that we allowed uh, uh, certain individuals uh, to, to take over the, the institution and to somehow uh, privatize them. So like um, the, the artistic union, for example, in, in Czech, uh, they, they have, uh, or it used to have uh, studios, galleries, uh, residency houses. And in 90s, when, when the changes happened, and as, as Dmitri told, that the artists were occupied by their own individual careers, somehow we, we did not take care about that and somehow it disappeared like for, for forever. So I was somehow wondering whether our generation of artists is also not losing uh, some, some territory within contemporary society, which we should fight to, to, to get it, to somehow uh, explore it or to nourish it. So whether there is, of course, uh, you uh, as an initiative, you doing kind of uh, different strategy that you, you're doing your in, initiative and you are slowly taking over the, the, the attention and the space and you get stronger. But my question is whether, whether we are not missing some, some, some territory uh, which is somehow taking from our hands right now. You'd like my comment? Yeah, yeah, could be. Yeah. Mm, you know, yeah, it's pretty um, very good question actually because your comparative <laughs> approach I really appreciate. You know, we are still have that bench of conservative. For example, Union of Artists in Russia didn't disappear. We have the same challenge to take over that academies, which also mega conservative. And also, I would like maybe to mention that infrastructure of houses of culture, provincial ones and big cities, are still quite quite interesting. But you need quite serious generation change in the movement of the people who really consider and concern about it. But there are pretty a lot of space to expand. But unfortunately, you know, we are still stuck with that pleasant, unpleasant paradigm of that kind of avant-garde where just 10 people doing something and communicate with young <laughs> generation. It's quite, okay, <laughs> especially for my generation maybe, but at the same time, it also reflects general uh, political climate. <clears throat> but at the same time, of course, you imagine more and yeah, it would be really interesting to see if that certain change of the power in Russia will happen one day. Unfortunately, we hope it will happen soon in 2024, but I didn't believe that Putin decided to stay forever and now it's really kind of <laughs> delayed <laughs> perspective. So I don't know, but we'll see right now in Russia coming kind of new institution, private one, especially in Moscow, which quite serious in expanding into provincial or outskirts of Moscow like we see. So I can criticize them for certain things, but certain things I absolutely respect and really um, enjoy. So. Thanks. And maybe Alexandra, she, she mentioned the, the situation within, within the art education, that there is this uh, 
critical disbalance between like female and male uh, personas involved. So this is maybe, but of course it somehow evolves, but uh, maybe this is also kind of territory which has to be reshaped uh, because if not, then it will be like this for uh, next hundred years or so. Yeah. Mm. Well, this is not me to somehow talk about it, and it's not my topic, and it's not something my engagement. It's not. I'm not a warrior for this. I'm not like a feminist who is um, trying to claim this or um, uh, pinpoint out the situation. But I'm just aware of the situation, you know. So, and as I claimed, like in the beginning, that I feel like as well like I'm some kind of an example like that serves some kind of purpose in order to um, I don't know uh, just like give some kind of um, description of the current situation within this kind of educational um, systems I would just say that it's just very slow you know and um, and I don't know like I mean it could be also that it's like a social structure is in a way um, in delay in a way so women may be also um uh you know like i mean just because also i come from completely different background for me feminism is not a topic you know because in ex yugoslavia somehow uh you didn't feel this kind of need to uh, emancipate you know it was never this kind of like um um substantial for a woman to come out or something uh while here I feel it's more kind of like a trend uh, at the moment. Uh, and of course it is a problematic, but um, on the other hand, I think you are still, um, you know, you still have me here, so it's, it's possible. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not saying there is, um, um, I think like, Feminists, you know, there, there, there's so much of, of like a movement which is at the moment going on, but I have problem with it because it's it's so radical that it's already super, super exclusive, you know, and it's also that it's not inclusive, you know. So for me, it's just creating another parallel, um, uh, super closed structure within this, which is just trying to demonstrate something very ultimately, you know, and even in a way like milit in a militant way, you know, so I can't identify with this as well. So I I'm just going my way. So this, uh, I'm not interested in this somehow. Thanks. Uh, my friend, our technician asked ask me to announce that if, if somebody who follows us want to, uh, want to have a question uh, placed, please, uh, uh, lift your hands and our administrator will allow you to to interrupt or intervene so from my side uh, i just want to thanks all and if you have some more comments please uh, feel free to 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 do it now so uh if I can say, because I'm, <laughs> I'm not female, but at the same time, as I would say, one of the few radical turns which happening in art right now is definitely feminization. And even <laughs> different form of vegetation, care, and so on. And actually, I'm very excited about it because it's really something completely new way of approaching art approaching relationship and i guess it really is the future and maybe it's the last decade when such situation when i'm as a man can do it i agree with alexandra a certain way it can be considered as exclusive luckily in russia we right now have quite old tradition of that as you mentioned in Yugoslavia, quite inclusive feminism, feminism based on equality, not on that kind of autonomy and certain type of separation. Uh, yeah. So, but at the same time, I would consider it as a more general aesthetic and philosophical 
movement, which is really very vivid, very viable and super powerful. And we learn through it. So I really, really think, of course, there are certain deviations which you might not like, which might find or in a dialogue with them. But at the same time, it's really substantial, especially the special shift in discussion of care and reproductive work, which is really substantially changed the art world right now. From grassroots and from certain kind of bureaucratic way too. So, which we might not like, but it's there. Mm. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Thanks. I maybe just a final final comment on that there was also like in good school uh, uh, presentation that there was this emphasis on a, on a local knowledges that there was this uh, quote tacit knowledge but um, and also in Pavel Buchler presentation there was the 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 commentary with the shift from a crafts towards skills so maybe. Uh, I, I'm wondering uh, how to how to keep in balance this uh, attention and care paid towards the the local uh, knowledge, which is somehow present in in the environment and nourished uh, um, in some tradition, and at the same time, like not to not to make it rigid and as a kind of academic rule. So maybe I want to just finally uh, ask uh, Pavel about about this process of uh, distincting distinction between the skills and crafts. Yes, I'm not sure I made quite sort of that distinction. Uh, I suppose one of the real problems mm -hmm. is that we are not certain anymore, or at least I'm not, and I can't see how anybody can be what, if any, model of art education is relevant for the education of artists? And, and why are we not certain of that? Why is it so difficult to tell? Because we are not even certain of what the subject, and, and in any education you need subject, in formal education, what the subject actually is. How do we define the job of the artist in the society? How do we define the skill set that artists need? What do they need? What, you know, what is it the things that they make or do and so on? And uh, one of the interesting challenges for art education could be precisely to try and find that out. Now, there are different schools of thought as to how it could be done. The dominant at the moment seems to me being very much kind of discussion oriented. Yeah? Uh, I would be sort of interested in a way of trying to find out through the practical kind of route of doing things and making things. Uh, and I suppose in the process, one could then discover not exactly what kind of skills are necessary and needed because they will always be uh, relative to each individual practice. But at least perhaps generically, that question that you posed for this symposium, how do we teach art under the existing institutional uh, uh, conditions and policies and so on, would become somehow more kind of tangible. You know, one could kind of uh, work with that question in mind. If you, if you shift it from the discussion or from the dominance of the discussion towards kind of more towards the, the uh, uh, focus on the process of making and doing. Thanks. Thanks. But for me, as a, as a kind of a positive uh, like orientation point of, of, of this uh, uh, um, unsurety un or uh, th there is this eman emancipation at the end like the the process of emancipation of the students so that they really uh, somehow become aware of their qualities and limits and they or the so limits of society and they be, uh, somehow would ha have a tools to to change to to modulate this determination the the 
these capacities. So, so for me, as you said, of course, the, the, the way how to do it is an uh, open uh, question and, and there are no, no particular like solution or strategies. But for me, the goal is, is this ability or the, the emancipation at the very end and in, a, in a very different forms. So. Yes, I mean, for as long as we have the concept of teaching, uh, mm. which perhaps is not always uh, uh, present in every form of education. You know, the good school concept, for instance, does not seem to have that kind of, you know, at the heart of it, that there is, a, there is an input which we call teaching. But for as long as we have that core concept, uh, which certainly uh, is there in the older academic model and in the university-based British model uh, to a very great extent, then we need to be posing constantly that question because uh, if we expect that those who are supposed to learn, i.e. the students, will sort of be somehow aware of their learning, then we have to be actively aware of what we are teaching and how we are teaching. Thank you. We are teaching at all. So, dear friends, I don't want to make it uh, like too tiring. So, thank you very much for meeting and for your contribution and discussion. Hope uh, you enjoyed it and we meet uh, in the future physically. Thank you very much and thanks, Vite Havranek, for, for building this format. So, Hopefully we'll meet. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. And Papa. Thank you very bye. much. Bye. Bye. bye.